welcome to Rap Stories, a show where I get the background on some of my favorite albums of all time by the artists who made them. I'm your host, David Dennis Jr., and today I'm joined by multi-platinum selling artist Ja Rule to discuss his album, Rule 336. <laughs> Typical day in the life of 14-year-old David Dennis Jr. back in 2000 went a little something like this. Wake up, go to school, come home, watch an episode of Dragon Ball Z, eat a little Hot Pocket, then watch 106 in Park and see which music videos crack the top 10 most requested. Which means I'd probably be watching the Ja Rule video. At that time, he always landed in the number one spot. After all, Put It On Me with Lil Mo and Vita was the biggest single from Ja's sophomore album, Rule 336. It stayed at number one on 106 in Park for 60 days straight. In fact, it was the first video that had to be retired. Before Put It On Me had its run, it was Between Me and You with Christina Milian that gave Ja Rule's first major crossover hit earlier that year. Both of those tracks were standout radio hits from Rule 336. To me, it's truly the gold standard of a Ja Rule album. I'd been a fan of Ja since his debut album, Vinny Veda Vici, which dropped a year earlier. That album was a gritty, gangster rap album that, yes, had the hit single Holla Holla, but never really diverged too far from the streets. Rule 336, though, birthed a global superstar. The aforementioned hits put Ja in another stratosphere that lasted for years and created a supernova, the likes of which we have rarely seen in hip hop before. But what I love about 336 even more is that it's the perfect blend of a guy figuring out how to make radio hits while simultaneously balancing those hardcore lyrics. What would I be without my baby? Yeah, I was in front of my TV singing along to put it on me, but it was tracks like Six Feet Underground, my second favorite Ja Rule song of all time, more on that later, that I fell in love with and find myself running back to even to this day. Playing the tracks again brings me back to sitting on my mom's couch in Mississippi, eating that damn Hot Pocket, imagining what these tracks would sound like in the club before I would ever experience it. More than together. Inseparable, you chose pain over pleasure. For that, you will never be a part of me. Mind, body, and soul, they know I and we, baby. See, I remember when y'all fronted on Ja Rule, acting like y'all weren't waiting for Free and AJ to announce he hit that number one spot for a song of the day. Like you weren't out there singing your heart out to his hits. But all that pretending went out the window when Ja reminded y'all 18 months ago that he wasn't to be played with during his verses against Fat Joe. For that performance, we were all teenagers again, reminded of one of the great hit-making runs of our lifetime. And that run started with Rule 336, an album that announced Ja Rule as a staple on the Billboard charts, radio stations, and karaoke machines across the world. But best of all, this album made me team Ja Rule even to this day. And here with me to discuss this triple platinum behemoth of an album, an MC that reached heights only a few would ever know, a man who defined what radio would sound like in the 21st century, and a damn good rapper in his own right, the one and only Ja Rule. Hey, David, I, do I have to do the interview after that? I mean, uh, <laughs> you didn't set it off. We're going to start with some deep cuts. I know I said Six Feet Underground was my second favorite. Ja Rule song of all time. Number one is actually from Vinny Vettavici. It's a super deep cut. I don't, I don't, I don't know what, like, what do you think? Like, can you guess, can you read my mind and guess what you think it would be? It's a super deep cut from Vinny Vettavici. I don't know if, it, if it's anybody else's favorite Ja Rule song. Um, Suicide Freestyle, maybe? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yo, we didn't discuss that either before. We did we not. Didn't we, did not. That. we did not. <laughs> Is that, some, is that just, something you, you get know, a lot? Do people? No, nah, that's just one of my favorites too, man. Like off that album. 
it was it was it was one of those records that I after I made it I was just like damn I should have made it longer. <laughs> it, was, it was such a good vibe, such a good groove, you know. Um, and and I think it, it lyrically and 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 you know flow wise it I was it really showcased my my you know my talent on that on that record in a lot of ways. Yeah, I agree. I do agree with two things. I, I wish it were like had three verses to it. But also, I think like yeah. it's one of those tracks that was like, you know, Ja Rule is, is radio and all that, but the brother can rap and like you were absolutely flowing on that track. And it's one I think that ages tremendously well because I still listen to it. Like it's one of the ones I still listen to. Uh, Love that record. To this day. Love yeah, that record. yeah, it's an absolute classic record. When I was a kid, I was like, man, one day, like, I want, I want ja Rule's going to do a comedy at a Ja Rule concert. He's going to sing do a suicide freestyle. And I'm going to go up there and I'm going to rap with Ja Rule and do that. Because that, like, that was just like the hottest song might, to me. You might have to check that out, man. I'm going I'm to I'm do a, a Vibes concert with, with, with okay. the Rule 336 album. And, okay. and that's what I do at my Vibes concert. You do the whole album, you know, with live uh -huh. band and stuff. So that'll, that'll be fun for me to be able to do a suicide freestyle. I've never really performed that record. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Word. So what, what was the... Um, let's get... Try to get myself focused. I'm trying not to do this for that one song. For album. That was one, one of the things I was most excited to talk to you about. But Rule 336, when was the last time you listened to the album in full? Um, not too long ago. Um, because like I said, I, I, I'm, I've been um, thinking about doing Rule 336 and Vinny Vitti, um as, as Bob's concerts. So I've been kind of listening to the record, you know, really listening to the, the deep album cuts, like you said, that, that I don't, get to perform some of them i've never performed so you know i kind of gotta you know learn some of them joints again but I'm, I'm pretty good with all my lyrics i'm I'm not you know one of those uh, artists that forget his lyrics what does this sort of bring up in you to, to listen to it again you know it's crazy it brings back you know those at the time of when i was making those records where i was going through um that's the best part about creating these projects this is the journey you know, what you go through making the albums, you know, what, what, what mind state, what mental state were you in, you know, creating these records. Um, Rule 3 3 because I was going through a lot, man. I was under a lot of pressure um, with this album. You know, um, the whole sophomore jinx, you know, uh, <laughs> pressure that they put on you for your second album. Um, and with that pressure, I was adding my own pressure, you know, just by really changing my, my whole style. That album was very different from um, Rule 336. I mean, excuse me, from Vinny Betty Vici. And, um, you know, when I delivered that album, the, the label, needless to say, they wasn't too fond of the, the new sound, the new Ja Rule sound. <laughs> Vinny Vetti Vici is very, like, I mean, it's hardcore raps. Irv Gotti's in this, like, gritty bag. You're in this gritty bag. What happens that first moment you hop in that studio and you start singing? Like, paint that picture for me. I, you know, it, it's it's crazy because as an honest, you want to be honest and and true to your art as, as much as you can be. And, you know, with my first album, I cherish that album a lot because it was my whole life up until that moment. That's who I was as a person up until that moment. You know, that's all I knew was was the the radius of Hollis Queens, you know, Jamaica Queens and South Side Jamaica. That's what I knew. I didn't know anything that really outside of that. So those stories that you hear on that album, on the first album, that's my whole life in a way. You know, issues with my my, my dad and, and you know how I love my mom and I'm having my you know, my, my first born, you know. And so that album took on such a, a therapeutic, you know, thing in my life it, 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 it just my second album I didn't want it to I didn't want it to be falsified I didn't want it to feel not authentic to what I was doing now and I know it was just a year later right. but in that year I had experienced things that I've never experienced seen things I've never seen you know I had fucking bought a mansion in, uh, in, in, in LA out in um, Hollywood Hills it was the most ghetto mansion you ever want to see in your life. <laughs> we had, we had, it was a, <clears throat> just to tell you how beautiful the house was. Bruce Willis bought that house after, wow. I, after, okay. after I got rid of it. 
just to show you the, 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 how beautiful of a house it was. But what we did to it, it was ridiculous. Like I had rid of thinner furniture there. It was just, it was my first time ever living, ever seeing anything beyond my block. And so I wanted the music to reflect that too. I wanted people to feel that ride with me. You know, I wanted to be honest with my music. And 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 so, you know, we as I'm going into the studio every night after, you know, days of being at the pool in the crib and, you know, at the barbecue and going to Laker games and sitting at, at the floor watching Iverson step over Ty Lue and, you know, my whole life is completely different. I'm living it up. <laughs> you know, that's 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 where the vibe of those type of records started to come from. You know, um, it, it was just different. And, and the melodic flow of it all, you know, it, it's so crazy because everybody thinks it, it was, you know, uh, something that I, I kind of did with 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 a conscious in mind. Like, you know, this is what I want to do. It, it really was just organic. And that's how I make all my music, all my albums. You know, it, it comes off what I feel. Each night is different. Each song is different. Each feeling, each each thing, you know, is different. And, and that's what it was with, with 336. It was just a whole different time for me. What was motivating you? I mean, you said like, I mean, you can go, you had a, your first album. It takes you out of your neighborhood. You're at the Lakers games. You know, I don't know. Is it, is it like com competition with other rappers? Like what is it that makes you that hungry for, you know, that level of like even more success for a second album? I mean, yeah, you know, I, I didn't feel like I succeeded with my first album. Really? Um, okay. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm in between two juggernauts. You know, X and J, those are my brothers. And they're doing, you know, orca numbers. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. X is selling three million a clip and shit. And, and J, you know, he just went four million with, with the Hard Knock Life album. And, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm over here selling my measly one and a half, two million. <laughs> <laughs> struggling. That, you know, you're struggling. <laughs> you know, but that that's how, um, that's how Leo liked to play it, too. He liked to play us against each other. He knew we were all very competitive. We all wanted to be the best. And so he would, you know, he'd drop in in the Murder, Inc. offices and, and, and you know, hey, you know, Jay J just went in and started working on his new project. And, you know, X album is finished. We're about to drop that, you know, and that would just be like, oh, okay, I can't let these guys outwork me, you know. And, and you know, all, all of those things were a part of what was going on in that moment. And I think we were all feeling that. Like, I'm not going to let him out work. I'm not going to let this guy out work, you know. Um, and so it became that that real competitive edge, you know. And, and, and as I become, became more of their peer and more uh, of their competition, you know, it, it, it really got fun after that. <laughs> How does that dynamic sort of change? Like, you know, Vinny Vettivici, there, you know, is it's three y'all on a on a record together and Ja Rule is like, you know, little bro a little bit. So, you know, um, you know, the mood of, of of our what we were doing changed a little bit. It was more like, you know, Rough Rider DMX, Rockefeller J Z, Murder Inc. Ja Rule, you know, and, and, and that was fine. You know, we were all, you know, making our bones in, in, in our own way and, and pushing hip hop forward in, in an amazing way, you know, but for me, it was, it was such a tell all time for me because like I said, I'm in the middle of these guys. Jay is selling records at, at a high clip and he's, you know, he's got like that persona of, of, you know, floss and money. And, and, and that was his thing. And, you know, a lot of hip hop artists were trying to emulate that, you know, and then X was the grimiest street, artists you you wanted to see he embodied that it was you know it felt it was so authentic you know you know so he had that locked up i'm somewhere in the middle because you know i'm from hollis queens and, and i'm very much a, a street dude but i you know us queens niggas we we, we like to find the things in life too <laughs> and so i was somewhere in, in between that and and you know um i landed right there in the middle on on making those those records for the women, you know, where, where nobody was, was tackling that, you know? And so that became my thing because, you know, I was always, you know, cool with the ladies, you know, ladies, ladies, ladies love rule. 
So we, that was fun for me. That was that was it, was it was perfect. It was like the perfect thing for me to, you know, a, attack. And and that was a conscious decision. You know, what were the homies thinking? Like you know, what I'm saying like what were, what were your like your friends who are like know you, you a know, certain way? That's, it... that's the best part of this conversation that I like to have because you know, I, listen, I, you know, I'm affiliated with some of the most notorious street dudes that right walk the face of this earth. You know, and 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 they were all about getting money, but getting chicks and and being with you know so that was their shit. And so I and and I never understood why hip hop didn't like why it had to be such a tough thing like 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 you know bitches ain't shit and fuck the bitches and this I, I didn't get that I was like nah because I'm with the real 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 street you know niggas and that ain't how they vibe they got a lot of respect for the ladies you know what I'm saying and 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 and, and they love women and it's a whole different vibe and so. I, I'm just, you gotta understand, I'm still young and impressionable. I'm learning from Cream and, and Black Just and, 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 and all of these dudes. And I'm seeing that and I'm like, yo, it's cool to love chicks. It's cool, it's fly. It's, it's gangster even, you know? And so I never felt out of place making those records. I felt like this was the new way and this is how, you know, we should approach this as real, real men, as real niggas. We should approach, you know, the way I'm approaching this and, and love our women, respect our women, give them love, show them love. And, and I think it started a new way, you know, in, in hip hop that, that in the likes that we've never seen, you know, um, you know, of course we've had our ode to the women before, you know, LL with Ali love and, you know, uh, Method Man, you know, you're all I need. And, you know, we go, we can go back to, to Curtis Blow and, 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 uh, uh, Daydream. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that was the first hip hop record ever sang in total, in, in its totality, by hip hop artists. So we can go back and and and, and see the history of it. It's, it was always been there, but I think I, I, you know, I made it my own and made it sexy and made it cool, you know, for artists to do that and not be looked at as lame. Even though you know, you know, certain artists came out taking shots at me for it being lame, and then turned around and did the same shit. And they did so, the same thing, right? <laughs> yeah. So so yeah. it really showed that the proof was in the pudding. That this ain't nothing lame about. You know, getting with the chicks and and, and 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 you know, showing your love for the lady. They're not lame about that. The hip hop and R and B connection had always been there, but it was usually sixteen bars, hook, sixteen bars, hook. You were singing over with the R and B artists at the time. Like when did you realize that your voice paired so well with these singers and you know, to take that approach to it also? Kinda early. After listening to like Holla Holla on the radio and how you know, how aggressive my voice came across over the airwaves, you know, I thought, and this is, this is crazy. This is going to be my first time ever saying this, but I thought that the reason why maybe I didn't have another hit off of that album was because I sounded too aggressive over the airwaves. And then and, and I felt like maybe, you know, maybe they didn't want to play, you know, those, a voice that 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 sounded that aggressive over daytime radio. So I said, you know what? Maybe if I give it that yin and yang, put a female voice that's a little bit lighter, you know, a little prettier on on it with my gruff voice, maybe that'll you know even it out and it wouldn't sound so aggressive. And it gave it a nice texture. I, I feel like you know, I, I I think those records, you know, that that was an accident. I, you know, that how that happened and how it came about, but. Once I realized that, yo, this really does sound good. You know, my voice with, their, with these female voices, I made it my thing. What do you mean it was an accident? What, what do you mean? It was, it was kind of an accident how I realized and noticed that, yeah, I really do sound good with these female voices. You know, like, that was an internal thing that I felt. But once I started doing records with the females, I realized this actually does feel good. You know what I mean? Talk about like figuring out that formula because it feels like Rule Three Three Six comes out, and you're like just automatic. You know what I'm saying? Like it just I'm, I'm sure like I liken it to like a an athlete in his prime. Just whenever you just when you go out on the court, you know you're gonna drop forty no matter what. How did you come about that formula, especially during during this album? You know I don't like to look at it or call it a formula. I just like you know I just I just feel like certain records and certain collaborations connect that they that they just they just have a chemistry and they feel real good. Me and Jennifer felt real good on 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 records. 
You know, um, me and Ashanti felt real good on records. Me and Lil Mo felt real good on records. You know, um, and so the chemistry with those females was very different. That's why we have multiple records together because, you know, I I I really always felt the chemistry with with those three different. You're right. I guess you know formula has a connotation, but I guess like did it ever feel easy? Did it ever feel like you could just you could do it whenever you want to? Not, not necessarily. You know, um, I I I felt like I you know, I after after my first album I made Rule Two Three Six. After Rule 236, I felt like I knew what I was doing in the studio. I felt like I knew how to make records. I knew how to make good records, you know, hooks, you know, um, uh, bridges, you know, the cadences and, 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 you know, Oasis. You know, like, I really started to to study music there, you know, music uh, uh, different. And so... You know, music theory, and so that 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 became more of a uh, a challenge for me, but but a great challenge because I I started to recognize what I was doing. I started to understand what I was doing. Like if I made you know a slower record during the winter time, you know people like to listen to slower music during that time. You, you know, you make up more up tempo records during summertime. People just don't even realize that that's just what they want. I started to understand those things after my second album. I want to definitely, before we get into some segments and some deep cuts, to really sort of shine a light on these women collaborators, the Lil Mo's, the Christina Milian, the people that you've done, especially on this album, and talk about their importance to sort of shaping the Ja Rule um, superstardom yeah. and, and legacy. I mean, all those women were amazing. Um, you know, it's so crazy because I see, you know, um, voices over tracks like, it's like other instruments to me, you know? And so as I'm writing these, these records and these hooks, I hear them. I hear Ashanti on it. You know, I hear Lil Mo. I hear, you know, Christina Young. I hear, you know, Jennifer. I hear Mary. And so that's the other beauty of what I got to do and why these duets came out differently. You know, records like Mesmerize, Rainy Days, you know, I'm Real because I wrote all of those records and wrote the whole, the record in its, in its entirety. I, I, you know, I interjected myself a little more than, than probably I should have, but, but that's what made it an actual duet because now I'm on the hook with them too. You know, we're going back and forth on the verses, you know, they have a verse, I have a verse, you know, it was different. It, 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 it was a different type of, um, uh, mesh, you know, between the two, a different type of collaboration between the two. Obviously, Triple Platinum, number one on uh, Billboard 200. Videos, number one on, on 106 Park. Uh, Put It On Me was the number one video on the BET countdown that year. Uh, and But I, as I mentioned, Maybe I think... I was the first video ever retired on 106 in Park. They, first they, one. They created the whole retire system because of Put It On Me. <laughs> right, I think I think putting on me would still be number one on one hundred six. Like people don't like people do not understand. Like it was like every day. You know what I'm saying? Like to come to be there at the same time every day, and it was yeah. like the news. News comes on at six. Putting on me comes on at yeah. five fifty five, and then we listen to that every single day. It like it was time. an institution. It was a great, great, great time for music. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you know, as I mentioned, we, we focus a lot on the hits, but the deep cuts, I think, round out the album. And I think a lot of the deep cuts, you know, would have been radio hits on their own. Like they were, you know, it was just hits top to bottom. Like I think about ecstasy. So you can tell me if I'm wrong. I think Rule 336 is the Ja Rule album, uh, definitive Ja Rule album from top to bottom. What, what do you think? I could go with that. You know, <laughs> okay. I, I, my first my first three albums, I think, uh, is, is my best body of work. Um, but then it's so crazy because, you know, somebody hit me the other day and it was like, yo, man, go listen to R-U-L-E, man. Like, uh, right. that album uh, should have been, you know, and, and, and it's like, you know, I, you know, I started going through the beefs and stuff. And so, you know, maybe I felt like some of the music wasn't received the same way. When, mm -hmm, but it's, it's fine. You know, it's like, 
when I do these records now, people don't realize when the beef started. When the, right. They just realize that, you know what? I really did like that record. And I, I didn't want to seem like a Ja Rule fan at that time, but I was listening to those records. And it comes out when I'm doing these concerts. And I, I know the timeline. And so I'm like, wow, this record didn't feel this big then that it feels right now when I perform it. And, and, and you know, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. It's all. I mean, I think perfect yeah. example is one with Bobby Brown. There's so many records like, like that one, you know, um, wonderful New York, all those records were made, you know, after in the, in the, in the time of it. And they clap back. When I do these records at shows, they ring off like they did before. And, and it just, it goes to show that people were listening and, you know, maybe they a little afraid to step out and be, you know, the 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 the, the person that was a Jaru fan when it wasn't cool to be a Jaru fan. And, you know, I say it all the time. You got to be a leader, man. You got to be a leader in this world. You know, you can't let people tell you what to like, who to like, or none of that. You know, um, you gotta you gotta um, you gotta stand on what you stand on. I mean, you know, maybe the biggest verses that they had was obviously Locks and Dipset, and people forget the biggest moment. Was a Ja Rule song, <laughs> you know, like out of all that stuff. That was going on, was a ja Rule song was the biggest moment. So you know, you know, you Big got shout that. Go. To my brother Kiss, man, right. like that moment was amazing. I remember, yo, it's so crazy. I'm sitting, I'm at my 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 brother Herb's house, and it was during uh, he was having like a, a birthday party, and there was a lot of people over there, and they were putting up on the board who was gonna win this, that, and the third, and there was a lot of dipset on that board, <laughs> but um. I remember Dipset throwing on their ver their New York song, and I was just sitting there, sitting in the back, you know, watching. I'm like, "Do it, Jada, just do it, Jada." And it brought the house down, like I like I felt it would if he, because I was just sitting there thinking, like, "You got to do it. If you do it, it's gonna destroy." And he did it, so I was, you know, I was happy that he did it. <laughs> I think maybe the most impressive accolade that came out, of, not just came out of this album, but like was part of it, is "Put It On Me" was about your wife. And yeah. you guys have been married 20, 20 years, 21 years, 22 years now, 22 years. And we got to talk about that. You know, that's rare in the industry, high school, sweetheart. Yeah. We need secrets for the 20 year marriage. Is it just, I got to make a, a, a number one um, hit song every time. Now nah, you ain't got to make a number one hit, man, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's not easy, you know, but as much as I say that it's not easy, I feel like it was, pretty easy for us. You know, we get along very well. And then I, I think that great relationships will start with great friendships, you know, or, or, or blossom into great friendships. Those combinations, those two things are special because, you know, I want to do things with my wife. I want to, you know, take my wife with me on vacations and be with her and take her on trips with me. And, you know, I want her by my side, even just going out outside to run errands and shit. Come on, baby, let's, let's go ride. Let's go run, you know. And we'll go do lunch and we'll go do, you know, it, it's, the, it's the time you spend, you know, with your significant other that counts. You got to make those moments count. But I think the most important thing for me and my wife's relationship, and I learned it early on, um, I was just living this great life, you know, and, um, you know, wife got three kids, you know, so she's at home a lot with the kids. And, what I started to realize is what was straining our marriage at that time was was the fact that, you know, we both come from Hollis Queens. We both come from the bottom. We both come from the hood. And, you know, this whole big moment is happening for me. And she's not really a part of it. She's not feeling like she knows she goes to the awards with me. and she goes, But she's not she's feeling like she's really a part of what's all going on because she's not making trips. She's not out on the road. You know, she's home taking care of the house. And when I realized that, that that was the key to our relationship, to, to, to keep it growing healthy and strong, was for her to be with me, to feel it, to be a part of my life, not just be the wife of Ja Rule, but actually be a part of this whole thing and be with me and feel it and experience it. And, and once I started doing that and she became more a part of everything and coming with me, feeling it and experiencing it, a lot of a lot of our arguments and stuff stopped and then the relationship started to change. What was the actual moment where you were like, I want to make this song about my wife? How did Put It On Me come together? You know, man, I was out in L.A. And, you know, 
when you're young and you're stupid and you you know you don't you, you don't think about not you know those days you don't call home for a couple of days you don't those things don't register as this person's worried about you not they're not just you know thinking you're doing some 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 foul shit you know but genuinely worried you know about you and I, i'm not thinking in these things and taking these things for granted no, but you learn. You, you, you learn as you get older. I'm, you know, all this shit was new to me, too. You know, I ain't never been away from home like that. Never had a girlfriend and a woman to care about like that and to be calling home and making sure she's okay and making sure that... No, it was my first time walking this dog. You know what I'm saying? So I had a lot of learning to do. And, and thank God she was, um, you know, willing to, to let me learn a little bit, let me become a man, you know, and grow, you know, and... and I, I think I think I did a pretty good job. What is the most memorable moment you can recall in the studio making this album? Ah, this album was 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 crazy, man. It was a roller coaster. A, to be honest with you, you know, um, we I was getting very high during this album. And so a lot of those nights, I, I it was blackout nights. I don't remember. I don't recall. You know, um, it's crazy. It's like really, really rock and roll, rock star shit. You you wake up. I, it was days I woke up in the morning and listened to records like I made that last night. It's just so crazy, man. Not how I was able to even function and move and get things done. I mean, I used to drink a whole bottle of Remy Martin to the face. So you know, I remember. Um, the the first photo shoot I ever did for Def Jam, um, DZ Graham, bless her heart, she she got the uh, the impossible job of of caring after my photo shoot, and making sure everything you know got done. And, everything. and so you know they try to oblige the artist. They ask they say, uh, they ask say, what does y'all like to drink? So I like to drink Hennessy. Okay, so you know that's no problem. They bring the Hennessy. They think you know you know I like a cup of Hennessy, y'all. <laughs> Took it to the bottle. head. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Smoking weed. She's like, yo. My and we spoke about this years later. She's like, that day I was like, I'm fired on the first artist that I ever worked with. <laughs> I'm gonna get fired. And she said, Yo, you did everything that you were supposed to do in that form, in that manner. And she said she couldn't believe how I did it. And it's just like I look back now. And I look at a bottle of fucking Lily Martin, I'm like, I don't believe I did that either. I don't believe how I was able to function. Because I'm a lightweight now. I didn't whine and shit. <laughs> no, a little sophist a sophisticated palate yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm super light. I don't even drink dark liquor no more. I'm, I don't drink my wine and I'm good, you know. But I'm, you know, I'm on my, I'm a health nut now. How, how, how the world turns, you know. Um, but. It's it's just it's just when you look back on it, man. It, it the memories of it all is 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 dope, man. I and that's what I tell young artists all the time. Man, enjoy the journey. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy, cause I forget some of the accolades, some of the things that you know, the platinum, the number one. That shit didn't register to me as much as it does to these artists nowadays. They're very conscious of all that stuff. We weren't, you know, I wasn't at least. I you know I just wanted to make dope music and we was doing that and you know my my heroes was you know fucking fucking method man and, and red man and epmd and you know they were going gold time and i that was my goal you know i wanted to go gold hopefully maybe platinum but you know artists weren't doing that on the east coast like that so i tell all artists man enjoy enjoy the journey man enjoy enjoy the dream you know live the dream enjoy the journey and, and you know, and you do have a that you do have an ode to ecstasy on the on the album, and yeah, then, for sure. You know, and and you know, Nori has Nor on Drink Champs has mentioned about how he's seen you, and then you make a hit <laughs> right after that. <laughs> so like, talk, yeah. talk about if you would like the the ecstasy in the process of do of of all this, also the creative process. You know, I, at a time I used to think, wow, you know, it's, it's the drug giving me that extra, you know, zone I need to get into. I feel like, you know, I, I've been there, done that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of the elder statesman, you know, in, in, in the game, one of them, you know, and 
it's time for me to pay it forward. You know, so I started Iconic Sound. You know, that's my my music uh, label, and you know I'm gonna be getting a lot of new talent and and and, and let them lead the way. And I'll play the background a little bit, but you know, still constantly pushing the pushing pushing the the, the culture forward. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that makes these songs, you know, so relatable and all this was that there was so much vulnerability even in these mainstream songs. And I'm struck even when I go back and listen, there's a lot of talk about these places of like deep pain and things like that. Where was that? Like, what were you talking about? What what was this like, these moments of pain that you were pulling from? I've been through a lot in my life, you know. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I pull from those things. I don't, I don't like to talk about my um, dark moments and painful things in my life because it's, it doesn't just affect me. It doesn't just hurt me. Just recently, I did um doc docu series and a documentary, and you know when I see my mom I have to talk about certain things, it hurts. You know, I I see my mom cry having to talk about certain things that you know is in our past and things that she went through and stuff like that. You know, it hurts, and I'm like, you know, I don't. I I don't want to keep dragging other people into my shit, into my, you know, whatever, because I'm really fine. You know, um, I've, I've self-therapied myself, <laughs> that's <laughs> okay. the word, <laughs> through the years. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm fully cured, but, you know, I'm happy, so that's all I can I got to do my thing whenever I talk to a black man or brother out there. Self-therapy is good. We got to get the professionals in there. And do all that stuff too. So I'm always an advocate of uh of getting that that hired help for sure. Yeah, mental health is uh it's a real thing, man. It's important to keep your your, your sanity and your mind healthy. What is a song on this album that you you know like I like for me like I said, Six Feet Underground just ages perfectly for me. Like it just it sounds like it come out now. It has the sample. It has the that sort of um. I don't know if Irv, Irv Gotti was like in a Kanye type of bag or something like that, but it has that, <laughs> <laughs> that little that chipmunk soul type of thing going on. But what is a song on this album that you feel um, ages really well? Put it on me, ages very well. I mean, it's, it's, it's aged like fine wine. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons my music ages well, or has been aging well, is one, Relationships are always going to be relationships. People, you know, um, love will always be in the air. People will always want to be in love or in the process of in being in love or, you know, those things. And so those relationship records work for those reasons. But, you know, another conscious effort I made making my records was I never wanted to date my music in a way by putting a lot of cars in my music or you know, references that would date my music. That was also something that I didn't like to do just as an artist because it wasn't me thinking about 20 years later. It was me thinking about a year later. You know what I'm saying? Uh, five years, two years later. Like, next summer, this this record doesn't have the same feel because I rapped about something going on last summer in this record. You feel me? And so I, I never wanted to do that in my record. And so I tried not to do that. Like, is there something that, like, as a perfectionist, as an artist like yourself, there's something you go back, you're like, man, this drives me crazy when you go back and listen to it on something like 336? Um, a little bit. Um, some certain thing, like, uh, on Put It On Me. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. What, what about it? There's one spot in Put okay. It On Me. And <laughs> I, I listen to it. To this day, nobody else knows or recognizes uh -huh. it. But um, I say uh, for, for forever, forever be, forever be instead of forever be. Okay, <laughs> I've never noticed it. Like uh, <laughs> forever be, pardon me, my body and so yeah, and, and I never got to fix it <laughs> uh -huh. forever. So if you listen to it now, you'll probably be like, "Holy shit, he just he said right. forever be." <laughs> So yeah, I, I am a um, perfectionist in the ways that I like to, you know, change little things that, that things won't bother me. But over the years, I've 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 come to be less of a perfectionist because 
nine times out of ten, you know, the the consumer has no fucking idea what you're stressing over. You know, it it it's really just something that a pet peeve of, of yours. You know, um, if I turn, you know, change this to that, it, it's such a small thing. You guys would never notice it, and you would probably party to it if it was that way or this way. But in my mind, that one thing that I changed or one thing that I fixed, that's why it's the hit that is today. If I'd have left it the other way, it would fucking work. You might have but fixed something. I, you might have changed something yeah. else around, and it, it yeah, wouldn't have been, it wouldn't that's, have been that's, the same thing. That's bullshit. That's, yeah, that's not. That's <laughs> not. <laughs> but I can think that. And perfectionists like to think that in their, in their mind. That's what's going on. Well, there are some songs on here that were just like, I mean, in the process, were there like attempts at like singles and things like that in making this that were just like, it's just not working? Like, was there just like a, a trial and error? Was it just like you just did it no, and it didn't happen? I don't have many records that the world hasn't heard. Let's just say that. When I make them, they come out. <laughs> I don't have a lot of throwaway records. And, 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 and even the records that didn't, you know, come out, for whatever reason, it wasn't because I didn't want to put them out. I keep going back to XZ because I, it, I think it to me it, it does age like a single, you know. But is there a song on here that you were like, if "Put It On Me" wasn't on here, or you know, you still had hits? But there's some that you were like, this could have been or could be now like the hit. That's a good question because you know there's a lot of records on the album that I wish I could have. Um, this thing was for, um, but back then it was different. You just didn't, you know, you couldn't do six. Things like right now, if I could drop Pain is Love right now, probably, I don't know, 10 of these records would have been on the chart. Were there any things that were originally a different type of song that made the album a different way or, you know, anything like that? There's one record that I, boy, man, I wish, I wish I could have put it out. I, I feel like it would have been such a big hit. Even to this day, I feel like if I put it out, it would still be a big hit. Um, I um, sampled Prince's Pop Life. Mm, okay. And that was a no-go. <laughs> yeah, I called it the Thug Life. It was dope. It was, you know, um, it was, it was, it, it was kind of like my, you know, ode to, to Pac and, and sending, sending love to Pac, but it had my own Ja Rule touch on it, feel on it. And it was fucking so dope. And I, I went to Prince and I tried to get it clear. And and Prince, you know, he asked me if I own my, all my masters and shit. And I was like, I, I, I don't. And he said, well, when you when you get that situated, I'll clear it for you. I own all my shit now. I know you. I know you're not here anymore. But uh, if 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 his uh if if, if his people are listening, man. I, w I would love to get that record cleared. I, I think it would still do well right now. <laughs> so he did the same thing to you he did to Nas, apparently, where he made you say you got to own the Masters. Oh, yeah. Just... Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. What was it like? So you met him? You met Prince, like, face-to-face? -face and... Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, tell, me, Prince, uh, tell, me about, tell me about man. hanging out with Prince. I need to know about hanging yeah. out with Prince. Hold up. You know, it's funny. One one night, um, we, we was having a, he was having a party at his uh, house in L.A., and we was all at the club and shit, and he took the party back to his house. And so when I get to the house, my my security guys are like my family. They're not really like security guys. You know, they're security, they're big guys, they're security, but those are my they're my guys, they're my family. So we get to the crib and Prince of security is like, Hey, Ja, Prince don't want no security in, in the house. So if you come in, you come hang out and everybody can come hang out, but we don't want no other security besides his security in the house. My man Fred, he was so mad at me, man. But but yeah, I went in and, and hung out with Prince. <laughs> <All right. laughs> and we had a good time, man. It was a lot of people there, a lot of artists there. He he liked to, you know, throw those type of shindigs at his at his spot and party it up. He was a cool dude, man. Really, really good dude. Y'all didn't hoop though. Y'all didn't hoop, right? We're not hoop, man. <laughs> After I seen that 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 Dave Chappelle shit, I'm like, damn, I wish I'd have got the hoop with Prince or right. <laughs> but Yeah, we we didn't hoop. <laughs> I want to talk about Ashanti a little bit because like these, you know, like as a fan, when Ashanti came around, it was like 
Ja Rule, you got a little mo. You got like, why do you even need anybody else to do this? But like, I, clearly, it, it becomes the thing where you realize what she brings. So I want to give you a second to sort of, even though she's not on this album, talk about the uniqueness and and give a Shanti her flowers. That's baby sis, man. I you know I love when I first met Shanti. She you know she used to come to the studio diligent every day, workhorse. And I you know to me that's the most important thing. You know. Um, when, when opportunity meets preparation, you know, that's that's when you have the most success. And she was getting her opportunity, you know, and she was prepared every time. And I love that about Ashanti. You know, it's crazy, you know, how things come about because I was such a big artist at the time and I'm, I have this record, you know, and, and, and Earl's like, yo, we get Brandy on it. You know, we put, let's, let's, let's call up Alicia Keys and get, you know, let's get Beyonce. He, you know, he's, uh, he's thinking, you know, we didn't have all the success in the world. You know, now he's like, shit, let's keep the bag going. And I'm like, oh, you know, she's dope. She's in the studio every night. She just did the big pun record. You know, I'm like, but she didn't have a vis she didn't have a visual. Like her voice was on it, but they didn't do it. They did like some funny little video and then put her in it. And so, um, I you know, I was like, I you know, I was like, yo, come on, let's give the 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 the, the new sister a shot. And we did, we did that. And I've been on that vibe since um, Rule 336, like, you know, give the new artists that, that look, you know what I mean? I was like, it was like, if I'm, if I felt like if I'm getting all of these fans at radio and, you know, I'm, we're, we're doing such big things on the label and as, as uh, I'm doing some big things as artists, let's, let's give new artists that look and that love, you know, and I, you know it's funny. I just seen a clip of that of me saying, actually saying that on um, uh, the basement with 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 Big Tigger, and I was talking about Christine Million. I couldn't even pronounce the name at the time. I was right. like Million Milan, <laughs> <laughs> and I was talking about you know that vibe of Route Fifty Six and how I wanted to give new artists that 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 look and and, and you know working with artists that hadn't had their whole shine yet. And that, that was. That was just who I was as an artist. And, and so Ubani was no different. And then we had that chemistry from day one. Always on time. Record came out amazing. And then we shot the video. The visual of me and I was, was, was money. You know, and so everything, everything just went from there. It was like record after record. Like, you know, we couldn't miss. Give, just, just give them two a record to do together. Give them a beat. Let Ja do the record. Let him do it. Whatever the fuck. And it's going to come out of smash. And, and, it was it was that you know, and she's still doing it. Her she got just dropped a new single. Hell yeah, yeah. Hell she's yeah. Still... She just dropped a new shit, a new record, and she's still out here moving. I'm still out here moving. You know, it's good to it's good that we still look good. Right, <laughs> <I'm 40. laughs> right, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. Shout out to Ashanti's Instagram page. I want to give give you some space to talk about what you're doing now and the artists that you're bringing up and things like that and your new new sort of endeavors. Also, I mean, you know, I'm I'm out here just working. You know, um, I created a new platform, my icon platform, and it's it's you know it's growing right now. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I want it to be one of the biggest companies in the world. That's my that's my goal. You know, um, and, you know we we taking baby steps, we walking it down. You know, um, I got my icon app. It's in the Apple App Store right now. You know, you can download that, and it's it's, it's Social happy, <laughs> you know. You, it's gonna about to be more social happy in a little bit, you know. Um, I'm, I'm adding more features to it, um, but right now you can, you know, I, I created it for content. We need some. We need some, man. Twitter about to be Twitter about to be struggling. We yeah, need something to go yeah, to, I'm, man. I'm, I'm, listen, man. I, you know, you're gonna be able to do a lot on Icon, you know. All right. Okay. The app. But um, you can go there now and and get in the Apple App Store and have six people on uh, on the screen at one time. And get tips in real time. You pick a few events. You know, uh, you know, all types of stuff like that. All types of cool stuff like that. And then I also created um, Icon Media, my Icon Network, which is in the Apple TV store. And and that I tackle uh, original content. So I've created a dope series for my Vibes concert series where I take iconic artists and maybe the classic albums, you know, with a live band. Really, really dope, you know, telling the stories behind the music, what they were going through when they were making that classic album, you know, shit like that. So, 
you know, I did the first one. Um, I did my album, Pain is Love. I'll be doing more. I'll probably do Rule 336 down the line. I'm coming. I'm pulling up. I'm pulling up for the Rule 336 concert. <laughs> I'll probably do uh, Vinny Vici eventually. But in the meantime, I've been doing it with other artists. Um, I did uh, Raekwon and Ghost. They did Only Built for Cuban Links, which was out of this world. One of the top 500 fucking hip hop albums. The top 500 albums, period, of all time by Rolling Stone. Um, and then, uh, like the big guy came, he did Long Live the King, which was amazing. He fucking killed it. And then, uh, he's doing, uh, Rock Kim, he's doing Paid Before. Ooh, okay. So, you know, we, yeah, we keeping these things rolling, man. And I got a bunch of other artists coming in season two. Okay. Of Vibe Concert Series. So y'all get ready. And so who, who would be now, if 106 and Park were out now, who would be the current, you were the undisputed all time king of 106 and Park. Yeah. You know, maybe, maybe, you know, you and Bow Wow could fight over it or something like that. But who right yeah. now would be the undisputed current king of 106 and Park? Probably maybe Lil Baby, probably. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe Uzi Bird. I mean, uh, uh, you know, these, these, these dudes are like little rock stars, man. Like, they, they rock stars in their own way. So, uh, it made my brother Raekwon calling me right now and shit. <laughs> <laughs> tell Raekwon to hop on the pod. We're going to talk, we can talk Cuban links with, with him. Tell him, tell him it's, tell him it's ah, a good yeah, time. Show, show. <laughs> I'll tell him, I'll tell him, uh, I'll tell him. Now I want to talk about the verse a little bit. Were you, when you were getting on that stage, you know, you have dealt with a lot. You've dealt with a lot in terms of like perception, things like that. Was there any nervousness about getting on that stage and like reminding folks like I said, pulled everybody's little card that they were trying to, you know, spend years trying to deny. But were, was there any nervousness about, you know, going out there reminding folks who Ja Rule is? At that point, the verse is that it had, be, it had become a performance. And I'm no more at home than I am right now when I'm on that stage. And so I couldn't wait. What's your favorite Ja Rule verse of all time? Maybe imagine. Ooh, okay. Uh huh. Why is that? I don't know if you ever heard that. Um, it's just a dope verse. I mean, I've got man, I got some really dope verses. Um, that I love personally, but that one is just just dope. Um, because it's it's it's, it's over the uh, Snoop and Dre. Imagine one of my other verses that I brought. I love so much that I was just I'm just talking about me in general, like what I've been through the whole time. You know, um, it's just a dope verse. It's on um, a record called uh, Press On with with me and Mary J. Glide. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's unreleased, but yeah, it's a really dope verse. Put it on, you got to put on some B-sides, man. You got to drop them, man. Yeah, I got I to I gotta drop some B-sides. What's your favorite ad lib? Hey, there. And I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We got it. <laughs> I guess that might be one of them, man. Yeah. All right. Last question is a question I ask everybody uh, before they go. What's one song from another artist that you wish was your song? I always wanted to make a dope record for my mom. After, you know, I heard Dear Mama by Pac. That is like the, 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 the holy grail of, you know, mother records and shit. I always wanted to do a dope one, but I never did it, you know, um, so probably dear mama <laughs> we know that's that's sort of it's sort of hard to do like to talk about your mother you know because it's so personal it's like as probably yeah. as personal relationship as you could have so it's, it's hard to execute yeah. you know and make it like a hit you know what i'm saying i don't want to do nothing lame and corny and shit you know, right, you right. make it sentimental loving but still have that thing where it's like wow that was really dope it's hard it is hard to do you know who did it well also drake I guess you got to um, have conversations with mom. That's, a, that's another dope one. Well, man, thank you, Ja Rule. This is a dream come true. Like I said, when we first had the idea for this podcast, I was like, I got to get Ja Rule. We got to talk 336. Because I think, you know, me, there's so much, you know, your career has been tremendous. There's so much to talk about. But I think we need to really, you know, it's important that we talk about and acknowledge you as an artist, like as a musical artist and the things you've done on the tracks. And, you know, the way you've constructed this this really incredible music that's defined so much of my life. So I am so honored and happy that you have been here. Yo, much love, y'all. This podcast is produced by Podville Media for Anscape. 
a black-led media platform dedicated to creating, highlighting, and uplifting diverse black stories. Anscape, where blackness is infinite. Dina Morrison is the series producer. Our production team, Brittany Danielle, Rob Spiewak, Lenika Belfield-Martin, Ethan Sands, and Eli Nellis. The series was edited by Stephen Williams, Kelsey Johnson, and Rob Ford. Executive producers, Steve Reese, Elizabeth Elson, and Oscar Zabayos. Raina Kelly is Anscape's vice president and editor-in-chief. David Oku created the original artwork for the series. Special thanks to Tracy Smith, Mike Shahade, Rami Mogadam, Katie Lawson, Beth Stoika, Anna Grambling, Ashley Melfi, John Gotti, Kelly Evans, Ryan Broadhead, and Kevin Wilson. And I'm your host, David Dennis Jr. Thank you for listening.